evening, folks. I am Lewis Redman, murderer, bootlegger, thief. Well, I'm a product of a culture where we seem to have a, a sort of a guarded respect for outlaws. Uh, I don't know why that is, but uh, I grew up listening to stories about outlaws, and outlaws were to be admired. Come on, Lewis. Let's be outlaws. You and me. Bad men. I find that I have an affinity for characters who find themselves, you know, uh, th through no fault of their own, uh, caught in a situation where they're forced to struggle for survival, and they struggle in a way that is admirable, or at least it is to me. They, they don't knuckle under, they don't hump their back and quit, they don't vanish into the darkness, they, they fight like hell. And I told the boys that I figured it was time we went on the offensive. And we saddled up and we rode back into town and on the way we run into that posse and we run their ice back to pick. A force as big as the Civil War you know, that destroyed everybody, or a force as great as the building of railroads through your property, or the forces that brought the land barons here and the timber people, you know, those are forces that are awesome in uh, their strength and power, and then you find yourself caught in the, in, uh, the path of one of those forces. Uh, and you fight or resist, uh, that's admirable, even it's, if it's foolish. This is from a newspaper interview that was supposedly made by a newspaper man who tracked Redmond down in his outlaw hideaway and interviewed him. And Redmond was very, very outspoken, you know, had a great deal to say. Um, Redmond the outlaw dried his sinful tears, oh my goodness, and the smile he always wears came back again to his face, though his voice was very sad and came from his heart when he said in his simple, unaffected way, it looks hard for me to go through all this. If they would only give me a chance. And then there's a parenthetical expression from the interviewer, God help him. Uh, it's got to be a total fiction. He rarely talked to anybody, and his wife said after he, after he was dead and gone, she said, all that stuff about my husband is not true because he was what she called stoic. He just didn't, he was stubborn, he didn't talk. But I would have to admit I'm just as guilty as the newspaper people are because if Lewis did not talk, I tell you, I've got him talking for an hour and 15 minutes. You know, he never shuts his mouth. Uh, but uh, that's what fascinates me about characters like this. What did they think? What did they feel? I'd never heard of Lewis Redman, honestly, until Gary came up and, and started this and then had the clips, the old Penny Dreadfuls and, and things like that. And I never realized that he was such a famous outlaw as he was at that time. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, Gary writes the way I talk, and uh, yeah, it read real easy. Now, long about here, I reckon we need to talk about why I'm making liquor is illegal. And when I wrote The Prince of Dark Corners, I wrote hearing Milton Higgins say every line I wrote. So it was literally written for him. He already had the mannerisms, the appearance, the gesture, the voice. He was Redmond. Hmm. The Prince of Dark Corners. I like that. I can spot a fake a mile away, and uh, Milton's language is not a fake. That's the way the, the, the guy talks. Uh, he lives in Burnsville, and his background is such that he's, he's the real thing. He's, he's a mountain person. I've just made Lewis me, more or less. You know, a lot of the, the things in the play, or I just take a situation 
and I know how I would feel. I took it pretty hard, him dying like that. I think Milton identifies with Redmond too much. I think that he's got a problem there. Uh, he's done the part now, I guess, 40 times. I don't know. But sometimes when I'm talking to him away from the play, uh, he makes me a little nervous because he's still Redmond. <laughs>